This is a commentary that takes you through the key points from the Noakes and Pridham chapter 17 um, about the Volksgemeinschaft, um, Germany in the 1930s and early 1940s. Um, it's taken from the second volume of documents, um, so we will push on. What I've basically done here is I've identified 11 key questions <coughs> um, which this um, podcast will um, I will walk and talk you through the answers to these um, questions. I won't read those questions to you. You can just pause the podcast and have a look through them. Okay, so the first question asks, it, it refers you to a document at the beginning of the chapter, um, which is Hitler speaking at the Nuremberg rally. And the question um, basically asks what Hitler means when he claims that Nazism is an ideological revolution. Um, it's always good at A-level history, um, if you can, to <coughs> include um, a very brief primary quotation, a quotation from an original source, um, into your answer. Um, and this is a, a, a this is an excellent source. You can actually set, I've, I've got a screenshot of the source for you there. Um, so basically, what does Hitler mean when he says that? Um, Hitler is saying that basically political power um, is a means to an end um, for other revolutions, other countries, other times. The end, the objective, is to actually secure political power to take over the reins of government. Um, if Hitler, or if all Hitler wanted was to secure political power, then he would have been content by the end of 1934 in terms of the um, the Reichstag fire decree and the enabling act. In other words, the legal revolution, because um, that dismantled the Weimar democracy, and it ensured that Hitler had physical control over Germany. But the key thing is, is that the legal revolution did not take control over people's minds. So central to understanding the people's community, the Volksgemeinschaft, is this idea, is that it was an ideological revolution. It was moving beyond just a legal revolution, but it was about ensuring that there was active belief and support, um, active belief over the way that people think. Okay, so it's very much a long-term vision. The people's community was controlling their actions, but also controlling their thoughts. Okay, so the next question. In Hitler's view, what was the cause of Germany's defeat um, and the cause of the events of the German Revolution of 1918 to 1919? Um, first of all, just to make sure we, you understand why I'm asking this question, what it's got to do with Volksgemeinschaft. Um, everything, in a sense, um, for, for Hitler's uh, worldview, his Weltanschauung, um, came out of um, the lessons he learned from Germany's defeat in World War I. So the whole purpose behind creating an ideological revolution, creating this Volksgemeinschaft, was to make sure um, that the terrible events from Hitler's point of view of 1918 to 1919 um, would not be repeated. Um, so... Um, the, the again the screenshot from Notes and Pridham is there for you, but basically the the point is okay that World War One was lost because of the a problem on the home front. It was a it was basically um, a collapse of morale on the home front. Um, from Hitler's point of view, wars are not just won by soldiers; they are won by all the people, the civilians at home. And again, from Hitler's point of view, the problem lay with um, agitators. Um, people without the, with the, without the right mindset back home in Germany. Uh, and in particular, he blamed it on Jews and Marxists. So from Hitler's point of view, the Weimar Republic um, that um, was set up, that, that existed for 14 years, um, um, was a product of the fact that the German people um, had the incorrect mindset. Um, that democracy was damaging, okay, that the defeat of war um, was damaging to, um, to, to Germany. So um, what did, um, what, there's a useful summary here in, in Notes and Prism, um, which you could very easily adapt um, for your answer. 
um, when you write about this in the exam, three points at the end. First of all, liberalism, okay, which is obviously a key feature of the Weimar Republic. What was wrong with it? Liberalism puts the individual before the community. Okay, the Volksgemeinschaft is the reverse. The community comes before the individual. Secondly, democracy puts the masses before the individual. Okay, so democracy admits ordinary people into decision making. Uh, from Hitler's point of view, um, the, the Weimar Republic um, uh, demoted heroic people. Okay, people with charisma, people with um, uh, who were born with the ability to lead, um, were sort of subsumed by the masses. That's what democracy does. It gives power to the people. Um, so the Volksgemeinschaft was the reverse. Um, individuals with heroic um, traits should be given the, uh, the means to lead. Um, and thirdly, Marxism uh, um, obviously uh, promoted class warfare. Um, and class warfare creates division. So the Weimar Republic, by allowing communism to exist, um, created a situation where there was class conflict, where Germans um, divided themselves up, identified with different political parties, and that created division within the nation. So the point of the Volksgemeinschaft was to reverse all of those um, traits. So those three points at the end are a very useful way of actually defining what the Volksgemeinschaft was. So question three sort of follows on from the previous question. In what way was the Volksgemeinschaft born out of the spirit of 1914? Um, and that's taken from page 376 to 7. So a new social order. It was a new type of society um, in which class conflict would disappear. Now be very careful here. Class would not disappear. OK, there were still social classes, there would still be upper, middle and lower classes. This is not a socialist society in which um, classes are removed. There will still be classes, but conflict between the classes will be removed um, and it will be replaced by a sense of national solidarity where all Germans, whichever social class you came from, will identify with each other because everybody is German. Um, and that unity will be expressed through Hitler's leadership, which would embody those values of we are all Germans, we must put aside our class differences and work together. <coughs> um, that is what weakened Germany during the Weimar Republic. Um, so it was based on the myth of August 1914, the day that war broke out. Okay, um, and again, that was a mythology. We have learned about the Bergfrieder. Okay, the coming together parties agreed to put aside their differences during the war. So, from Hitler's point of view, the greatest moment of his life was the beginning of World War One, when, from his perception, um, German people put aside their differences. And for a, a brief period, certainly for 1914 and 1915, um, nationalist fervour took over the nation and people forgot their class differences. So the German right wing, um, in particular the Nazis, but the German right wing in general, so the conservative right, seized upon the spirit of 1914. And when the war came to an end in 1919, the right wing were mobilised by the fact that we've got to bring about the end of the Weimar Republic and restore that unity that brought Germans together at the beginning of World War one. So the major domestic goal was to recreate the spirit of 1914, a united nation ready and eager um, to pull together. And of course, war was the great unifying factor, which is why Hitler um, always believed war um, would be good for the German nation. It would strengthen the uh, spirit of the nation. So war um, was a, a, an essential characteristic of the um, Volksgemeinschaft. So even between 1933 and 1939, when Germany was not at war, the spirit of the national community was, we are at war, we're at war with communism, uh, for example, and so we need an enemy to pull us together. Okay, in the next slide we've got a couple of useful terms. Um, it's always good in um, A-level history essays to, to um, 
you know, show your precise knowledge, and part of showing your precise knowledge is using the German word. Um, again, it certainly brings you above the level of the textbook um, if you can sort of like naturally incorporate these words into your writing. Um, so two key terms for you here. Um, uh, Gemeinnutz um, vor Eigenutz, okay, um, th that term there. Um, put the interests of the nation before oneself. That's the sort of key aspect of Volksgemeinschaft. And the second one is Volksgenosse. Um, a Volksgenosse is a good national comrade. In other words, a, a, a German who has the right mind fret, mindset, um, who is... Um, who is showing Gemeinnutz for Eigenutz, okay, putting the nation, interests of the nation before oneself, okay. So that, there's that uh, spirit of um, individuality, um, your personal um, happiness um, should um, be secondary to the needs of the nation. Your role in life is to strengthen the needs of the, the, needs of the nation. That's um, uh, the mindset of the Volksgemeinschaft. Question five, um, what do Notes and Pridham mean when they say that, um, quote, Nazism was above all else an ideology of struggle, force and violence? It's picking up on this sort of theme that um, um, the great lesson um, that Hitler drew from the start of World War One on the 4th of August 1914 and the, for certainly the first 12 months is that what war did is it brought the German people together. Um, so that kind of like... Um, that sort of notion that war was good as a unifying factor, um, sort of um, coalesced, joined up with, in, Hit in Hitler's view, um, his social Darwinist um, ideas, um, which, of course, was that um, human life is, is tough and uh, it's about the survival of the fittest. Um, life is a struggle. Remember Hitler's um, book, Mein Kampf, um, <coughs> means my struggle. Um, <coughs> so the Nazis ideology, Hitler's world view, was very much shaped by the belief that, um, that people's will, their determination, their self-belief um, and resilience um, was absolutely central. So that was a sort of key concept of uh, the Volksgemeinschaft, a good German um, has got to be determined, believe in themselves, and has got to struggle. Because what struggle does does is it um, weeds out the weak. And Germany, if Germany is to survive and pull together, it must be united. Um, but it, it must be strong Germans united, and we must make sure that, that there's nobody weak um, who will weaken the nation. Um, so um, <clears throat> from Hitler's point of view, um, that translated... Um, to the sort of domestic goal of war. Um, it's not just struggle between individuals to weed out the weak, it's the struggle between nations to weed out weak nations. That was very much part of Hitler's world view. So war was good um, and you know, war was necessary to bring the Germans together. So the main goal of domestic policy was to prepare the German nation for that struggle, okay? And, and that meant preparing you know, the German economy, part of the Volksgemeinschaft, um, was w preparation for war was not just material preparation, creating weapons, but it was psychological preparations. It's creating the mindset where the Germans will never um, give up because, of course, that's what went wrong with World War I. Um, so nationhood was defined by the Nazis in terms of race, in which the German nation, um, to survive, needed to promote Aryanism. So from Hitler's point of view, um, the definition of a good national comrade being a German was not just the fact you had a German passport and you were a German citizen and you spoke the German language. Um, being a German meant you had the right racial characteristics. Okay, the De definition of nationality was biological. It was your blood. Um, and so um, those who did not were not of the Aryan race and 1% of Germans were Jews, um, effectively, from Hitler's point of view, were polluting the bloodstream of the German nation um, and weakening nationhood. So that sort of key thing is um, the Volksgemeinschaft defined nationhood in a racial way. That's another characteristic of the Volksgemeinschaft. That then leads to the next um, related question. Um, how did the Nazis define an acceptable Volksgenosse? 
So remember, Volskanossa is a uh, is a comrade, is a is a is a member of the national community, is a somebody a German who who is showing the right um, um, mindset. Gemeinnutz vor Eigenutz. So, what were the key characteristics? Um, how would you define? Um, how did Hitler define an acceptable Volksgenosse? So, first of all, they had to be of the correct racial type, okay, which was, of course, Aryan, um, which meant they had to be hereditarily healthy. Um, uh, so, um, being a, an Aryan also meant that um, yeah, you 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 uh, did not carry genetic diseases that could be passed on. Hit the Nazis introduced laws very quickly, with sterilization courts um, that um, prevented um, a good German would not have children if they had a genetic disease. Um, so they were sterilized. But also being a good German meant you had to be socially efficient. Here's another good word for you to learn a German word: like the, the definition of socially efficient, Leistungs. Fairhig, um, which meant you basically, you know, you, you were contributing to the strength of the Volksgemeinschaft. So, for example, you would choose the correct marriage partner. Okay, if you were a good Aryan, you would marry a good Aryan. Um, now, effectively, the Nazis introduced laws that made that compulsory, but likewise, divorce was um, enforced um, it, um, on couples who um, were not, um, uh, if, if an Aryan was married to a Jew, for example, um, then uh, the Nazi regime very quickly introduced laws um, that enforced divorce and separation. Um, another characteristic of a of a Volksgenosse was to be ideologically reliable. Um, you, you, a good German would not just passively follow; they would actively support the regime. So you would actively join Nazi or Nazi groups such as the Hitler Youth if you were a child, the uh, Lehrerbund, the Teachers League if you were a teacher, etc. Um, and you would not just go along because you had to. You would show that you were an active supporter. Thus, the Heil Hitler salute would be an outward sign that you believed. Um, and another sort of characteristic is that the Germans were encouraged very much to believe, to see the nation as a biological um, being, um, like an animal that needed space to live and breathe. Thus, the sort of notion of um, uh, war was good because it uh, uh, enabled the German animal to expand um, uh, uh, to take land from neighbouring countries to give a, 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 like an animal in the jungle needs to have territory. And so a Volksgenosse was like a cell within that biological organism. The individual only has significance in terms of his or her function within the national community, like a cell is there to, to um, keep the body um, as part of the whole body. The individual German was like a cell as part of the biological body Germany. Okay, so question seven. Um, what Nois and Pridden then do in the second half of the, um, this excellent chapter is they start to, ex um, having, having defined what um, Volksgemeinschaft was, um, in the second half they sort of um, move into the underlying weaknesses of the concept of the Volksgemeinschaft because in the end Nazi Germany obviously failed, um, defeated by war. Um, and the the drift of the the argument that Noakes and Pridham use is that it, it, even if there hadn't been a war, ultimately the Nazi regime would have put, torn itself apart due to the contradictions of the Volksgemeinschaft. If you actually dig deep into it, um, it did not work. Um, so what were the sort of central weaknesses? Well, um, here's this question. Um, it's the conflict of the archaic, archaic is old, and the modern. Um, um, so Nazi ideology, okay, so um, on the one hand was archaic, okay, so what does that mean? Um, a key feature of the Volksgemeinschaft um, was um, that Nazism was very anti the modern age, okay, so it was anti-capitalist, um, anti-industrial, 
Um, he was anti-capitalist in the sense that, that, that Nazism was against greed, um, that a good German should not be to make money for themselves, it should be to basically strengthen the German community. So a greedy businessman who only wanted to make money for themselves was being selfish, was not putting the nation first. Um, anti-industrial. Remember, Nazism was a product of the um, the, the lower middle class, the middle stand, um, who in the 1920s were very much threatened by the growth of big business. So many of the sort of like grassroots members of the Nazis um, were hostile to big cities, for example. And you can see that in Nazi propaganda, um, that when Hitler was campaigning for power, it's what we call Blut and Boden, blood and soil. Um, the, the message was that the Nazi regime would restore the traditional patterns of the old society the old values simple values built but based on the countryside and to a large extent that also came out of um, social darwinism yeah this sort of like emphasis on the law of nature so from the from the um, the nazi point of view the best germans were those who came from the countryside blood and soil so that's all very good um, Hitler was sort of promising a rest restoration of the old traditional values built on the countryside and on the peasants. But at the same time, Nazism was about preparing for war. Um, Nazism was in many ways uh, um, presented as a modernising force. Um, they wanted to get rid of the old order in which there was class conflict and replace it with a new order um, in which it would be based on new ideals, the ideals of achievement, Leistung, um, that um, society would not be divided by class, but society would be divided by um, race, uh, racial characteristics. And those who were biologically the most fit would be promoted into positions of um, leadership. So Nazism, in that sense, was a very, very modern um, force. Somehow that doesn't sit comfortably with the blood and, but and, uh, the blood and soil um, uh, notion, which was very archaic. So that's sort of like the key points that's been made in that um, in that section. The um, next question sort of um, develops that a little bit further. So the question is, explain the contradiction between ideological theory and, and economic reality. So uh, uh, the same sort of point, really, that we're making here. Um, ideological theory was anti-capitalist, anti-industrial and anti-urban. Okay, So Nazi ideology sort of promised blood and soil, a return to the traditional old values, um, where life was simple, um, based on the countryside, <coughs> fundamentally hostile to sort of urban um, city, um, the development of cities. Remember cities, for example, um, communism had developed within cities. Um, and the Nazis were fundamentally anti-communist. Um, but on the other hand, the, the whole dynamic, the aggressive nature um, of Nazism, um, as we've said, social Darwinism, um, national unity pulled together by the concept of war, meant that um, Germany had to expand territory um, if the country was going to hold together. So war, therefore, became a central objective. War requires rearmament. If you're going to make weapons, you need to develop industry. If you're going to develop industry, you're going to develop cities. And therefore, people are going to have to leave the countryside to go to work in the cities. Thus, we have a basic contradiction in Nazism, a fundamental weakness of the notion of the Volksgemeinschaft. So that um, internal contradiction um, um, fundamentally weakened um, the Nazi movement. It was a contradiction. The Nazis, in the end, were never really able to find a way out of. They, they look for ways out of that contradiction, and that's what this question is about. The question asks, how do the Nazis try to resolve these contradictions? Okay, so it's a nice little section in the chapter 17 there. You've got the screenshot to read it. Um, but basically... Um, the way in which the Nazis tried to, you know, they, 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 our starting point is there was confusion. I put that sort of word there in there. Um, the German people were confused. They were getting mixed messages. On one level, they were told the countryside was great, the, 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 the old values were important. Um, but on the other hand, they were being told we must prepare for war and we must, you know, the, the whole drive of the economy um, was in, in conflict with blood and soil. So 
people were confused. So how do you actually um, remove that confusion? So basically, um, it came down to Nazi propaganda. It came down to, well, we've got to get hold of their minds and somehow remove that confusion using propaganda. So what the Nazis did is effectively two things, okay? There are two ways they tried to do this, and neither of them really worked, okay? First of all, um, it, it focused on those aspects of ideology um, which were clear-cut and easily understood, for which there was no clear conflict. And the key aspects of ideology was there are enemies in our midst, okay? So don't think too much about the positives of Nazism, because the positives don't make sense, there's conflict. So let's focus on the enemies. That's easier to understand, okay? Um, hatred is a simple um, concept. So that's why Nazism, inevitably, the propaganda moved away to some extent from the, the positive aims, because the positive aims were full of contradictions, and began to focus on the enemies. First of all, the communists, the Jews, and then when World War II began in 1939, the Allies. Um, so, simple concept. It's our duty to obey. It's our duty to tackle enemies. It stopped people thinking about the, 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 the other um, contradictions. And then the second one, um, Goebbels very quickly realised that it was actually dangerous to get people th to think too much. Because if, if Germans try to understand Nazi ideology, they become aware of the contradictions. So Nazi propaganda increasingly became a dumbing down type of propaganda. It discouraged too much thinking. Um, it provided undemanding entertainment. And Goebbels propaganda from the late 1930s onwards, um, he pretty much abandoned sort of like making films, for example, that try to explain the Nazi message. And he just simply provi provided fodder. Um, yeah, much the way Hollywood today sort of produces sort of mind-numbing entertainment, sort of like uh, exciting thrillers, etc., etc., um, just to keep people happy. Um, so increasingly, political indoctrination was abandoned by the Nazis. It's just really a question of, 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 of taking away the German people's ability to think for themselves. So that's sort of there was a shift in in, in what the Volksgemeinschaft meant um, over time. So the uh, question 10 um, develops that. Why do these two resolutions also contradict each other? So you've got these two sort of like solutions, um, but they likewise contradicted each other as well. So um, on the one hand, uh, Nazi propaganda, of course, is trying to politicise. Part of the Volksgemeinschaft is sort of politicising the masses. It's re requiring repeated active gestures of conformity, the Hitler salute, the ha hanging out of the um, flags, etc. Um, lots of official rituals, participating in uh, the special celebration days, 20th of January, Hitler's birthday, um, 12th of August, uh, the Motherhood Day, um, etc. But on the other hand, Nazism is aiming to depoliticize. Again, that's a nice word for you to use um, the masses by turning them into passive um, Volksgenosse. So, being a Volksgenosse um, is, um, uh, as we said, the 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 key, you know, the the early objective was to be an active follower. But then the Nazis realised that if you're active, you're going to think too much. So we don't want them to think too much. So we're going to depoliticise them. So there's a contradiction there. And on the whole, the Nazis, what were they most successful at? They were more successfully at generating passive consenters rather than active believers. Um, the majority of Germans, um, in the end backed the Nazi regime as long as it provided for their basic needs. And Hitler quickly realised that the most important thing was basically putting food in their cupboards <coughs> um, and providing the basic needs of life. If we try to sort of get them to actively follow our policies, um, they're not really going to be that interested or they're going to become confused. Um, so being a good Volksgenosse in the end, it became just basically being a happy German. So it began to shift over time. The final part of the um, chapter, um, uh, and the question is, how do the Nazis provide a 
quote, a vehicle for the ambitions of a younger generation. Um, so the final part of this chapter um, uh, focuses in on the young people. Uh, Noakes and Pridham um, make the point that the Nazis benefited hugely um, from the fact that they provided an opportunity to a generation of young Germans um, uh, who actively supported the regime, um, primarily because the Nazis came to the power on the, on the back of the cataclysmic years of the Great Depression where there was massive um, unemployment. Um, and there was a sort of, in terms of the demographic, demographics, a bulge in the population that were hitting um, adulthood at the time that Hitler came to power. And they were very much mobilised to support the Nazis because the Nazis um, provided jobs. And at a time when um, the economy was starting to improve anyway. And so many young Germans identified the Nazis with, we are... They are facilitating work. They're giving us work, but also um, those sort of new values is that you could, in the, under the Nazis, um, achieve promotion, um, achieve positions of responsibility, which perhaps you would never have had those opportunities in the old Germany of the Weimar Republic and certainly the Second Reich before that, um, where um, those sort of notions of class obstructed social mobility. The Nazis were saying, no, you can achieve, you can achieve positions of responsibility because there's a new type of German here. So young people galvanised by that sort of notion of um, uh, Leichten, achievement is based on being ruthless, etc. Um, suddenly there were opportunities to get on in life that they never had in the old Germany. So the Nazis provided a vehicle for the ambitions of a younger generation, which during the Weimar period and also during the Second Reich before it, um, had frustrated those ambitions, and that sort of that argument is very much part of the Schönbaum, the the, the social revolution um, thesis, um, that um, Nazism um, created a new type of society. It got rid of the old order and it created a new order, and that was very very appealing to the young people. And so part of the energy, the dynamism that pushed Nazism forward and created that huge energy was the fact that the membership of the Nazi party and the backing of the Nazi party was very much the young people. Okay, so that's the end of this uh, video cast. Hopefully that was useful to you. You've got the, um, throughout the video, you've got scanned uh, screenshots from the original chapter by Noakes and Pridham for you to read. Thank you.